thank you for watching this week's sermon. We hope you're encouraged and blessed by it. If you want to know more about our church, please visit our website at southportchurchonline.com. I hope this week is a blessed week for you, and if we have not met you, we would love to. Please visit our church um, at either our 9 o'clock or our 1030 service on Sunday. God bless. When you're amplified, people pay attention. So pay attention. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Dana Phillips. Sometimes I greet you at the door. I um, am the Women's Ministry Director, but I don't have a lot of letters behind my name. I'm just a girl who loves the Lord. Um, that's kind of why I'm here. Micah asked me to give this message, and I said yes. And another thing about me is that in the body of Christ, I'm the mouth. So if you know me at all, you know that about me. I really like to talk. <laughs> right? Right? So, the movie was great. Um, I had to go to the movies. How many have seen the movie? Oh, hey, better than first service. Good. Um, I went to the movies because I'm preaching on the movie, and I kind of had an idea what the heck was going to happen. It was a good movie. It was fun, funny, predictable. But I'm not going to give you a, you know, a critic. I'm just going to read you the synopsis from the producer. Okay. Everybody's favorite family of superheroes is back in Incredibles 2, but this time Helen, a last girl, is in the spotlight, leaving Bob, Mr. Incredible, at home with Violet and Dash to navigate the day-to-day -day heroics of normal life. It is a tough transition for everyone, made tougher by the fact that the family is still unaware of baby Jack-Jack's emerging superpowers. When a new villain hatches a brilliant and dangerous plot, the family and Frozone must find a way to work together again which is easier said than done, even when they are all incredible. So in the movie, the family's trying to be normal, um, forced there by a law banning superheroes, and it's challenging because their superheroes' powers is part of their identity. And they're kind of having a bit of an identity crisis, and throughout the movie, their actions, sometimes causing harm to do good, leads to the ultimate verdict, which is to reinstate superheroes so they don't have to be illegal. So at the very end of the movie, hopefully this isn't a plot killer for any of you, um, there's a judge, and it's the final scene, and he puts his gavel down and says that su the superheroes are now legal again. So throughout this movie, they're trying to balance that we're illegal, but we're trying to do good, and ultimately they get their final verdict. And that is what I'm going to talk about, is our verdict today. So the title of this message was Obedience, but I really wanted to call it Why. Why are we obedient? So that's what I'm going to kind of bring us through today. Sometimes, like non-superhero humans, we have identity crises like the Incredibles did. Why, who are we? Why are we here? What are we trying to achieve? And most of all, why? Why? Why are we working? Why are we striving? Why are we serving? And that's kind of the question that I wanted to ask you guys to ask yourselves today. And I want to try to answer that question today a little bit. Not just humans in general, but Christians ask that question. Who am I and why? So in the DIY series, the anchors groups went through this spring. did a great, great message on the why and the who. Not the why, sorry. Back that up. The who. The who are we? <laughs> so the very first thing he said in the who are we, as first, we are children of God. Whether we want to be or not, we're children of God. Atheists, children of God. Sorry to break that to them. The second thing is we're sinners saved by grace. Okay? But that's not the end of the story. It's the beginning. The sinner saved by grace isn't where your story ended. That's where your story began. Now we have to look at the why in all of that. So we're going to go back to the beginning literally what they feel like could be the beginning of Christendom, which is the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." So the very first thing he's saying is make disciples. So disciples are students. So we always want to be learning. We want to be learning more. We want to be students of the word and students of what Jesus told us to obey. 
And the second thing he said was baptize, literally baptize in the river like Jesus did, in the horse trough, whatever. Um, but the word baptism, I'm going to channel big fat Greek wedding here, comes from the Greek word baptismo, which nobody laughed. Did you all not see big fat Greek wedding? Okay, we got one. Um, so baptismo means immerse. So literally immerse in something. But when you're immersed in something, when you come out, you're different. So if you're dunked in a red dye and you come out, you're not the same color anymore. So when we're immersed, we're not the same color anymore. That's the second thing that Jesus is telling us. Be a student and be immersed in the word. And finally, teach them to obey. Not just rules to follow, but how to obey. And this is where the church can have a bit of an identity crisis. We get caught up in the supposed to's. We're really good at that. But we don't talk about the how. And most importantly, we don't talk about the why. And I'm hoping in the modern era church, we can get past the supposed to's and understand our why in all of this. So we've been taught to obey. And the word obey has several meanings. And I looked it up because my sermon's on obedience, so I needed to know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> so, Obey is the verb. Comply with the command, direction, or request of a person or law. Submit to the authority of. Carry out a command or instruction. Behave in accordance with a general, principle, or natural law. That sounds like a student. That sounds like a student to me. The very first thing he said, make disciples. Make students. So in that, that's, what our obe that's what obey means. Obey is the verb. Obedience is the noun. But why are we obedient? Is it because we have to? Or is it because we want to? Like, I don't want my husband to have to love me. I want him to want to love me. Have to's are like coercion. It's almost like abusive. You want to want to do something. I don't think God is about forcing us to do things. I think he wants us to obey him. And he wants us to love him. I heard someone say once, God's love language is obedience, and I loved that. I was studying the five love languages, and it really kind of changed how I thought about things. Shock of all shocks, my love language is words of affirmation, because I'm all about words, um, and quality time, because you have to be with me to talk to me. So um, just ask my husband, he'll tell you. But God's love language is obedience. And when I heard her say that, I wanted to look it up and find out kind of for myself, so sure enough, in John chapter 14 and 15, there's a whole list of Jesus talking, saying, if you love me, obey my commandments. Those who accept my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. And anyone who does not love me will not obey me. In chapter 15 of John, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as you obey as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. So that's all fine and good. But I don't, I don't want us to have to white-knuckle our obedience. You know when you white-knuckle something, you're trying to do it in your own power. So here you are with your own power, holding on, trying to do this. You're white-knuckling it. I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. I have to do this. I have to serve. I have to obey. There's the have to of the love factor. That's not really true love. So I think we need to define the why. Why are we to obey and to what end? In our culture, even in the church, we get caught up doing good things, sometimes even for the wrong reason. So just like the Incredibles, they're doing, they had to do harm to do good, and they're trying to make it right. We want to do things for the right reasons. But this is what I think has happened. Sometimes when we turn our obedience into a have to, we feel pretty darn good when we succeed, right? And you know what that is? That's pride. And pride and ego are sisters. They're actually different sides of the same coin. So pride, this is C.S. Lewis talking, pride is not being proud of what you do. Okay, my microphone just, oh, there we go. Pride is doing it better than somebody else. So as soon as you feel like you're doing it better than someone else, that's where pride comes in. So then there's ego. Do you remember when I spoke last fall, I talked about ego, edging God out? We want to do it on our own. 
We want to, we white knuckle it. We do it under our own power. And sure enough, who, who is not getting the glory? God, because we're doing it on our own. And you know what your ego does every day? It builds its resume. It always wants to be a little bigger and a little better and letting you and everybody else know how good it is. There's a great book by Timothy Keller called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Highly recommend it. And in it, he talked about when he was in high school, his mom was saying, Timothy, be part of the chess team. It'll look good on your college resume. Timothy, go feed the homeless. It'll look good on your college resume. And he's like, I don't even like to do those things. Why do I want to do that? But that's what your ego does. Every day, it's building its resume. And at the end of the day, you either have regret or you have pride. You have shame or you have hope because we're building our resume. So the next day, we do it all over again. Here we go, building our resume. Because your ego is an empty void and it needs to be filled. And what is it filling itself with? It's filling it with our have-tos and our working. Sometimes we're doing great things, but we're doing great things for the wrong reason. What's our reasoning behind it? So we're just, we take this principle of obedience and we try to do it our own way and we edge God out and sometimes it's just a little bit at a time. So it's like a compass, due north. The compass has 360 degrees, but 360, little, tiny, okay? One degree, you don't really notice it. Two degrees, maybe a little. You take a couple steps, you're still looking at north, but you're heading a little bit this way. A mile later, you can't even see north, and you're only off by two degrees. So you keep doing things the right way for the wrong reason. Before you know it, you're over here. And due north is over here. Your direction. Where's your direction? We're kind of doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe it's for bragging rights. Maybe we think our performance is going to earn a reward. A daily reward. A simple little daily reward. Like someone saying, hey, I did a good job. That's okay. That's okay. But it has to be for the right reason. And maybe, just maybe, we've gotten so off over time and the enemy's whispering in our ear, and we start to think that our redemption is our reward. That's wrong, folks. Oh, we know in our head. We know in our head, but we don't know in our heart. We can have an 18-inch issue. 18 inches, that's what it is. Oh, our head knows all these words. I could quote scripture to you. I can throw Bible darts, but do I have it in my heart? Do I know in my heart? But here comes our loving God and all of his wisdom. He's just pulling us back on course, back on course. He says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 in the New Living Translation, by God saved you by his grace when you believed. That's it. What do you have to do? Believe. Not hard. You're not working. You're not earning it. You're believing. That's it. Goes on to say, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. That's our pride right there. So what did God do? He just ripped our ego right out of the equation. Sorry, folks. Are you doing it for the wrong reason? There goes your ego. It's gone. He took it right out of the equation. Could you imagine if God worked it out differently? If where our works and service earned our redemption, our ultimate verdict, the ultimate verdict is what you've done at the end is how your verdict is going to come in. Well, in Timothy Keller's book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, he talks about our egos and our performance and the ultimate verdict. So we're going to think about this for a little bit. We, we have the truth. It's been around for however long you want it to be, let's say 2,000 years, 3,000 years, and a little bit off course, man just takes it, moves it just a little bit off course, and a little bit more off course, and a little bit more off course, and we have different religions, monotheist, polytheist, doesn't matter, there's different religions. So let's talk about those different religions. Buddhists believe that their performance is going to earn their ultimate verdict. They're working their whole lives. Muslims believe that too. If I do enough good, if I do more good than bad, my ultimate verdict. Agnostics, I'm a good person. 
Good things will come to me. Performance equals verdict. Do you see the difference here? And we've gotten so off course. We're working and we're feeding our ego and its resume all the time. And Ephesians 4.14 says, We are tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. There's your due north. You just lost it. You're carried away by every wind of doctrine. You're just blowing around in the wind. And the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But here comes the divine cosmic switch. We're working, we're treading water, we're trying to measure up, and you know what happens? Jesus happens. And you know what he did? He threw us a life preserver. So when I was working in VBS last week in the Extra Event Center, which by the way is not air conditioned, um, I had all these life rings hanging on the, on the wall in there. And the kiddos were learning what? Jesus rescues. That was the theme all week long. Jesus rescues. And it just, I just got it. it. Because how does God speak to you the most? Through your circumstances. He can speak to you through the word. Sure. He can speak to you, but he speaks to you through your circumstances. So here I am planning for this message loving on these babies, and all over the room are these life preservers. It says Jesus rescues. You know what he's doing? He's throwing us a life preserver. He's saying you're over here. You need to be over here. All you have to do is hang on. That's it. So when he said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, he was not starting an exclusive yacht club. Okay? He was throwing us a life preserver. He's saving us. When his apostle John asked him, how do I go with you? Because you know, Jesus is telling them that he's leaving them. He says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You want to go to the Father with me? I'm it. That's it. He's throwing us a life preserver. If I had as many people in the room as there is here, I would throw these out to you. That's what he's doing. He wants to save us. Compared to the other religions that we talked about, our verdict is in. Our performance doesn't equal our verdict. Our verdict equals our performance. Okay? So now we're sinners saved by grace. And our why is because we're sinners saved by grace. Now we love, serve, grow. Because our verdict is in. We don't earn it anymore. It is finished. And in 2 Timothy 1.9, there's scripture to back this up. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. We still have egos. And sometimes we have to, several times throughout the day, relive the gospel message and tell ourselves, the verdict is in. So this is it, the divine switch. Our verdict equals our performance, and that's our why. That's our why. Not because we have to, but because we want to. So I'm going to go back to where I started with. First, we're a child of God. Second, we're a sinner saved by grace. That's your life ring, saved by grace, threw the life ring out to you. But that's not the end of the story. Now we get to live it out with our why defined. And Romans 8, 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're not condemned. And we're not working it out anymore. Because our verdict is in, we can do it just for the joy of doing it. Like that song says, the joy of the Lord can be my strength. So sometimes we just need to take hold of that life ring. But we can be looking right at Jesus, walking on the water with Jesus, like living it out, right? And you know what happens? We look down. Here comes the waves, tossed around by the waves. And Jesus is like, would you just look at me? Would you just look up? Sometimes all you have to do is look up. You've already caught the life ring. You could be heading due north. You look down. You know what you're doing? You're sinking. And what does Jesus says? Look up. All you have to do is look up. He's going to get you right back on course. And when we say, yes, Lord, Lord is like a boss or a CEO of your life. And we may not always agree with what our boss does, but we still have to... Obey him. Just so you all know, 
Um, my husband is my boss. Um, so sometimes I have to do what he says, even though I don't agree at work. Um, <laughs> but anyway, when, when, when God tells you to do something or whispers something into your ear, no Lord is not an answer. Okay, when God put stand firm on my heart, I was a little bit scared. This is a kind of an undertaking, you know, but no, Lord, it's not an option. It's not an option. You don't get to say no to your CEO. I just came up with it. That's my very own. <laughs> not because we have to, but because we want to. And we are building. So my great friend Kathleen, who is a, Texan, California, now she's transplanted to Texas. She's a great writer, and God gives her amazing things. And so yesterday she wrote a blog, and it was so such a beautiful example of what I'm talking about, how what we do in our lives is not about us. It's not about us. It's about, wow, God is amazing. It's not about, wow, Dane is amazing. No, wow, God is amazing. So she went to Rome, and she went to St. Peter's Basilica, which took like 160 or something years to build. This is two generations of people, their whole lifetimes building this place. And there were workers that built those pillars will never know their name. It's coming up on its 400 year anniversary. We don't know the names of all those men that put all that work in there, but they did it to honor the Lord. So we can go to Rome and say, God is amazing. Isn't that what we want our lives to be? At the end, we wanna say, wow, God is amazing. So I'm gonna read you the end of her blog post because it just, really fit with what I was saying today. The things we do every day, the way we show up, the tireless efforts at work, at home, in prayer, in each relationship, as we serve others in the world and in our churches, we are building something for the Lord. Whether anyone ever attaches my name to it is immaterial, truly. What matters is those who walk through the basilica of my life someday stop and say, wow, God is amazing. 